All right. Take two. Okay. So, hello, everybody. So, I'm Isaac Lichtermark. I'm a grad student at UC Berkeley. And uh, I'm going to talk about the last field trip that I did before we all went into our separate bubbles. This was a, a three month long uh, field trip to the Baja California Peninsula and to study the whole flora, including lots of different types of composites. But it was also the last trip as part of my dissertation research on this tribe, the rock daisies, Peridolii. And there's one of those shown here. So I'll try not to, this isn't gonna be a rock daisy talk. I'll try not to go into too much depth on those, uh, but I'll, I will mention a little bit about them because they're super interesting. So, uh, oops. So the Baja California Peninsula is, is in Northwest Mexico is the location. And it's a super interesting area floristically because uh, it, you know, it juts out into the ocean, it has an element of isolation like an island, but it also covers this huge latitudinal gradient from Mediterranean climates to desert and then also to uh, tropical climates in the south. And there's actually a backbone of, of uh, sky island like mountains that, that kind of run down the top of the peninsula and a lot of those have mesic forests on top. So it's a really, it's actually a super, you know, diverse and uh, interesting area of plant endemism. And, uh, you know, for me, it was convenient. I basically left my home in the Bay Area of California and drove down the peninsula following this uh, yellow brick road here. And when, uh, you know, passing through Mediterranean climates and desert climates and when reaching the, the southern part of the peninsula and the tropical part, looped around and basically made my way north and all the time zigzagging through different places to uh, find interesting plants. There were, uh, this was a big collaborative kind of uh, field trip. I mostly traveled with my fiance, Sophia Winitsky, who is also a, a systematic botanist studying uh, legumes, another lesser diverse mega family of plants, and our dog, Rio. And uh, we worked with some amazing botanists who uh, are active on the peninsula, including Dr. John Redman in San Diego and Alfonso Medel. Um, from the HCIB herbarium in La Paz, Jose Delgadillo in, en in Ensenada, and a lot of really great field botanists, including Carlos Gonzalez and uh, Sula Vanderplank. And we also collaborated with a huge group of biologists working on all different types of biodiversity in the peninsula. For the most part, we used a, a four by four uh, pickup truck to arrive at environments, but we also traveled overland through prickly uh, cactus forests by foot and on mule, you know, uh, putting our field presses on our backs and, and getting onto these uh, mules. And we got to islands on pangas occasionally. Obviously working on these cliff habitats is hazardous and uh, you know, you can fall off the cliff or parts of the cliff can fall on you. Uh, but then there's also more cryptic hazards like this uh, endemic Baja California rattlesnake, Crotalus michelai and this U4, VACE plant, Endoscalus, that just leaves a horrible sting. It leaves you stinging for, for hours. And uh, if you do fall, you know, you might luckily have your fall broken by some nice cushy cacti. <laughs> but uh, it's a really great place to work. Here's the, the beach and, uh, and an, an example of one of our, um, you know, field excursions where we basically followed this yellow line up the mountain to a cliffy habitat and this is the habitat where you find the Baja California rock daisy, Peridoli lobata. It's a really interesting plant and uh, it's typical of the rock daisy tribe in the sense that it's an ecological specialist that grows on these tall vertical rock cliffs and it's rooted in the cracks and crevices of the rock cliffs. And they show all kinds of, uh, you know, they really like living on these rock cliffs. They basically are only found there. And as the, they show some interesting adaptations, including as the heads uh, develop, as the fruits develop, the pedestal actually bends back and it plants the fruits back into the cliff. That's one of the reasons why it's, one of the reasons why they're really only found there. And they actually grow in association with the really diverse, um, you know, flora of other plants that are also only found on the cliffs. There, this is a, a Eucnidae, Eucnidae aria, and the Loisaceae. And both of these plants are restricted just to one mountain range in the Baja California Peninsula where they only grow on cliffs. And you can see they have similar leaves and, and actually that Eucnidae shows the same kind of adaptation where uh, when the fruits develop, the pedicels bend back and extend and they actually plant the seeds back in the cliff. But uh, 
Baja California Peninsula is actually a really interesting place for rock daisies because they seem to have undergone some, you know, a kind of ecological release where there's lots of different life forms found there, including some of these ephemeral annuals that germinate and they uh, go to flower and fruit within a couple of months. And they really only reach the height of maybe like a dog's heel. They have these very res resistant fruits that hide out in the seed bank for, for waiting for rain. And some of these more like kind of monstrous looking uh, succulent perennials that, um, that grow in dunes and in decomposed substrates. And they, they seem to have, you know, taken advantage of lots of different habitats. And that's actually historically been recognized on the basis of morphology and chromosome numbers that the Baja California Peninsula has kind of a lot of interesting forms of rock daisies that seem to be peripheral to the main kind of uh, radiation of perennials on rock cliffs. And actually recent molecular research seems to confirm that this is an area of a lot of early diverging lineages in that tribe. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of other comps that I'll show. So this is a closely related tribe, uh, the bone sets, Eupatori, also has a lot of interesting plants in this area. Uh, but they all lack uh, ligules. They all lack ray florets. They have these really exaggerated uh, style branches. But in some cases, the style branches kind of bend back around that periphery, and they, they sort of mimic rays. And that's really clear in one of my favorite plants, Hoffmeisteria fasciculata. This is just a beautiful one. And it even has kind of like a you know, uh, like a, sh a shading going on here from white to lilac along the edges. This is a really nice uh, Baja California endemic that takes a more traditional approach to approaching pollinators with its uh, brilliant colors. Um, but approaching, you know, uh, um, uh, attracting a lot of bugs can also be dangerous. You know, they could come and eat the flower. So it's well protected with this cocktail of secondary metabolites. It's produced from these glands. This is one of the plants that Oscar studies, so I, I'm sure he'll show more pictures of this one. Um, and then there's some uh, interesting examples of secondary heads on the peninsula, like this Alvordia glomerata, where all the all there's uh, basically a, a lot of heads clustered together for maximum pollinator attraction or potentially protection for fruits. Uh, this is a cool one that I, I like, Heliopsis anomala because you can see the, the palei are just super robust. The disc flowers come out of these palei and then when the fruits develop, they're kind of like protected by them. And then here's the opposite kind of example, Sclerocarpus divericatus basically has like a naked receptacle and the fruits are just sort of hanging out on there. Uh, and then here's, here's, it's always nice to see when, when some of these plants take like a business in the front and party in the back kind of approach uh, in this Biden Zantii, the, the, the disc fruits have the more classic Biden strategy where they, they clamp onto animals and disperse far. But the ray fruits, they have these kind of quirky callus margins that help them stay put. Uh, and then here's one that is just like a true succulent aster shrub also endemic to the peninsula. And it looks like uh, the kind of sedum that you would see in your garden, Culturella capitata, really interesting, weird plant. And one that grows on the dunes and has kind of like a dense covering of hairs on the leaves to help protect against uh, UV light. This is Palafoxia linearis, linearis, sorry for the typo. But uh, of course, there's also some weird mystery comps that would be great to find in the peninsula. And this one is like a dream for every botanist working there. Vaxonia pusilla was last seen in 1898, it's presumed extinct, but it, you know how many people have gone looking for it. It's kind of like a little rare composite, uh, tiny and uh, only found in a, a tropical mountain range at the southern end of the peninsula. And uh, it's unclear where it falls out in the family. And actually Harold Robinson studied you know, the only known specimen and kind of thought it might be one of these weird, uh, you know, kind of long branch things that might fall somewhere in the Helianthi Alliance, but who really knows? So we drove down there and we went to go look for it. Well, we, we didn't find it, but we did find this interesting shrub when we were looking for it. At first I took a photo of and I thought, hmm, this is maybe a Bahiopsis or something like that. But then I saw the fruits and I'd never seen a Bahiopsis with fruits like that. It's got these really interesting filaries. And I've been trying throughout the whole pandemic to try and figure out you know, what this plant is. And, and I've consulted a lot of botanists and we think maybe it may be a new taxon that needs description. So that's something that's a study in progress. All right, so without going 
too far. I just want to thank a lot of people who helped out with this project and for all of you for listening to this talk. So uh, if anybody has questions, I'm happy to take questions. But what we could also do is we could just uh, move on to the next field talk and do all the field talks in succession and then just do a lot of questions at once too. If you want to, you can put a question in the chat. Um, so the next person who's going to talk is a, a graduate student at UC Davis, Oscar Inojosa who's been a really active member of TICA so far and participated in the journal club and uh, is going to show a lot of really cool asters that I, I know he is excited to show. So Oscar, if you want to share your screen. It's great, except I think you may be muted, Oscar. Still muted. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, all right. So I'm Oscar Hinojosa Espinosa. I am a graduate student at the University of California in Davis, but I'm actually from Mexico City. And I've been working on systematics of uh, the Marigold Campus City in the tribe tragedy. And I'm pretty much interested in systematics and also in anatomy of mostly Mexican complexity. So I'm, I'm going to show some uh, pictures of the field work that I did during 2019 and 2020, in which I visited a great variety of ecosystems um, to collect, for example, those uh, species that grow near water, sometimes partially aquatic. Uh, also in gypsum sand, gypsum dunes. Most actually like dry places, like um, dry conifer woodlands, scrublands. Um, some of them occur in grasslands, in allocated grasslands. And there are very few uh, taxa that occur in humid tropical forest. So this field work was mostly to collect species or, or samples for DNA analysis, um, samples for other species in the genera adenophyllum and thymophyllum, which I'm, I'm focusing mostly on my um, PhD dissertation. Um, these guys are mostly Mexican, there are some Species also in the United States, some others in Central America, but um, they, they're mostly restricted to Mexico. For example, these two guys are endemic. Here is an example of some of the ethnobotany that I'm uh, so interested in the last few months. So like the relationships and between plants and people how people, um, like, like the meaning of plants for people, like the uses, the traditions. So I collected this species of uh, a marigold, Tachidis lucida in central Mexico. And this is one of the very few species in, in the tribe that is used to induce visions, it has some hallucinogenic properties. It is known by a variety of local names in the northern part of the country. It's known as Yerbanis or Anisillo. It has like an anise smell, like an anise scent. It smells really, really sweet, nice fragrance. Yautli, which is like a more indigenous uh, name. It is also the name of a pericon, mostly from central part of the country and the southern part of the country. And I kind of think that this is perhaps related with the word perico, which is like an informal word for cooking. 
And however, it is mostly known as a medicinal plant and it's used to make an infusion, make a drink, and this drink is used to treat a variety of ailments. Um, some people also use it to make like uh, crosses like this. And, and these are put in the, in the gates, in the doors, in the windows, just to try to repel like bad spirits. <laughs> I found this guy, the Crocephala integrifolia, which is in the tribe Astri. This guy is native to tropical Africa and Asia. And it's like the first time it is found and collected in Mexico. And this one's in Chiapas, which is like the southern part of the country. We actually made a quick paper about this because we thought it was sort of relevant. And it was hard to identify because, again, it's like a native from the old world. I've never seen something like this before. I thought it was like a mastery, but it took me some time to figure out where it was. In the field, I was not even sure that this was like an mastery. I thought it was like an APAC or something because um, like the heads are very, very small. Um, the heads are disciform, so they have two types of flowers. Um, these things here in white are the pistillate flowers, which have like a white corolla, and narrower corolla. And in the center, there are like the typical disc flowers, which are perfect flowers that look more greenish or something yellowish. And it's like the second record of these, both the genus and the species, in the Americas. So if you guys seen this thing, hopefully not, in the new world, it is perhaps the cyclosphere folia. And I found many, many other species, but I don't I just don't have time to talk about all of them. Um, but here's just a brief uh, like I'm illustrating here briefly some of the species that I found. It was basically random. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it, it goes like clockwise. So this is like Bidens, we call it Coryopsidae, Trixis, which one of the um, its uh, compositives with bilabiate corollas, and Akin or Cypsilla, Rimenium macrostephanum. This guy is subaquatic. Almond um, Castor, Bautiflorus, also in the light water. Very beautiful species in the Yabi. Megaliabum and Juyeuxii. Actually, I'm not quite sure about the status because there have been some changes here. Perhaps he's already in Sinclair. And my last trip was to Baja California Sur, in La Paz. Um, it was almost one year ago in March 1920, but I had to stop because the new shelter in place order. Um, as perhaps you can see here, it was already like empty, quite isolated, isolated. And no people, basically, you know, friends, animals. And I had to stop. I just could collect, I don't know, Pigum speciosum. And had to quickly return to California for the border, the US Mexico border was closed. So I decided not to show pictures of this. And Isaac already showed some pictures of these beautiful species. And that's it. Thank you so much to all the people who helped me out during the field work. It was a lot of people. Uh, and got some funding from Davis, from the department also, from my scholarship. Yeah, thank you. Great job, Austin. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so uh, if you have questions for Oscar, you can put them in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself now. Otherwise, we'll move, we'll move along to the next talk, uh, uh, which will be uh, Carol. Um, so Dr. Carolina Siniscalci, or I don't know, I might have messed up the order. Yeah, it was Naomi now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so next we'll have uh, Dr. Naomi Fraga who is a, the Director of Conservation at the California Botanical Garden here in California. 
and she is a really experienced field botanist and has a, a you know a, just is an amazing floristician. Um, her PhD research was on uh, the the family Phrymaceae, including the monkey flowers. And she's done floristic work throughout uh, the deserts and also the, the coastal parts of Southern California. Uh, and um, she's, she's gonna give a great talk, I know. And recently she's also become a great uh, purveyor of plant memes online as, as well. <laughs> Thank you, Naomi. <laughs> Thanks, Isaac. Thank you for promoting my memes too. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about um, rare compositae from the deserts and mountains of Southern California. Uh, this uh, photo on my title slide is of the alpine regions of the San Bernardino Mountains, uh, which is an area where I do a lot of work um, related to my conservation work at California Botanic Garden, which um, and many of you may know it by its previous name which is Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden, located in Claremont, California, Southern California. So I just kind of want to start off with um, an overview of um, the, the geography where I conduct my work. Um, my work really is primarily conducted in California. And I have sort of, a, I think, a, quite a broad home range. Um, we're located here in this part of California, but I do work really across Southern California, especially in Eastern California in the deserts and in these uh, transverse ranges here. This is a, a map that shows the topography of California and you can see there's very high um, elevations here. Um, and uh, you know, the there's great heterogeneity in California, topography, uh, geology, climate, et cetera. And it, it really leads to some exceptional plant diversity um, where we cover and work with many, many species um, across um, a broad area. Uh, so I do want to dedicate this talk to um, <clears throat> the Los Angeles sunflower. Um, this is, um, I work in plant conservation. So conservation is first and foremost in my mind when um, I'm doing my work and it sends me to see lots of plants um, in the composite and so, uh, the Los Angeles sunflower, unfortunately, is presumably extinct. Um, it is, um, for all intents and purposes, I think, uh, very much extinct. Um, it occurred in the area where there's modern day Los Angeles occurs and um, has been impacted by development and um, total habitat alteration and hydrological. Uh, it was a species that occurred um, in Cienega habitats. Um, and then there's this really great quote from a recent paper that on vascular plant extinctions in the continental United States and Canada, where they noted that preventing extinction is the lowest bar for conservation success. And that's what I think about when I do my work um, on rare plants. And, um, uh, and I hope we have, um, you know, that the Los Angeles sunflower is an exception um, and not the rule for the future. So um, the first plant I'd like to discuss is the California dandelion, uh, Taraxacum californicum. This is a species I've done quite a bit of field work with and it occurs at the high elevation in montane meadows in the San Bernardino Mountains. Um, it is listed in the United States under the Endangered Species Act as endangered. And I would say probably one of the rarest species um, I know about um, in the United States. There's like some doodling going on on my screen that I'm not sure if everyone else can see that, but it's kind of distracting to me. It's, anyway. Yes, uh, please, the person who's doodling stop or you're gonna be removed from the, from the talk right now. Thanks. <clears throat> um, so this um, uh, Taraxacum is just really gorgeous and has these pale um, kind of bluish fillories and real pale yellow, um, ligules and also um, tends to be quite glaucous and have often more smoother leaf edges. Um, and this is the geography where this plant occurs. Um, so here we are down here in the San Bernardino Mountains and um, this is Big Bear Lake. And Big Bear Lake is not a natural lake. It was inundated in the early part of the 1900s. And so there's a dam right around here. And this was actually meadow habitat that's since been inundated and um, 
so many populations were extirpated through here. And then there's lakeshore property in and around here. So there's lots of habitat fragmentation, alteration of hydrology um, and habitat um, degradation going on um, that this species is subject to. There are some populations over here that's in wilderness area, and those populations are probably the best and most intact. But I would say this is a species where there were populations I visited 10 years ago had hundreds of plants, now have tens of plants, and then populations that had tens of plants about 10 years ago um, some of them I haven't seen any plants um, in modern times. So it's a species where we really need to do a lot of work and we're proposing to do more field work and have just applied for funding to do um, work to um, do additional seed banking, pro um, develop propagation protocols and hopefully enhance populations, but also to um, kind of redo um, some of the past genetic work um, and this is some of the meadow habitat where it occurs. There's these really extraordinarily lush meadows in the San Bernardino Mountains. They're really beautiful. And I love doing work here. Um, it's unlike any other habitat in Southern California. It doesn't feel like Southern California. And there was this great study by Lyman and Elstrand published in 1998 in Madronio, um, where they did some bagging of inflorescences. They did chromosome counts and they did an alizyme study and found that this is a sexual species itself incompatible. Um, it's interesting that it has an aneuploid series. It's a tetraploid um, and it has relatively high genetic diversity, um, especially com with, when compared with uh, the congener taraxacum officinale, the common dandelion, which co-occurs with it at these meadow sites. Um, so we hope to do more work to um, advance conservation of the species and hopefully that work is funded and I'll be doing field work for this species this year and next year. Uh, the next group I want to talk about, or the next group of species, this is a group of species, a whole genus. Um, this is probably one of my favorite genera in California, is the genus Hulsia, uh, known as alpine gold. It's a small genus. There's only about seven species and 12 taxa. And there are annuals uh, to very short-lived perennials. Uh, this species is Hulsia vestida variety perii, and it occurs in the San Bernardino Mountains. Uh, this genus is really um, a group that's very diverse or, or predominantly occurs in um, California. Um, and it occurs in a lot of montane regions, but very arid habitats. Um, and many of the taxa are narrowly endemic. So um, there's uh, species or taxa that I often do surveys for and or we're doing work to seed bank them. And so you can see they occur here from Oregon and in these montane regions, many taxa in the Sierra Nevada um, coastal Southern California, mountains, and then down into Baja, California. This is a close-up picture of, or a close, more close-up picture of the, the vegetative body. You can see how fuzzy and wooly they are. They're very, very soft. Um, they're just, oh, I love touching them. They're so great. Uh, this is another picture of the Hulsea vestida variety perii. That very first photo I showed in the alpine areas of the San Bernardino Mountains, um, there's a Hulsea vestida variety um, alpina grows in that region um, in the alpine areas. So they, they are in the Hulsea vestida grows from desert areas to alpine areas uh, across California. And this is my very favorite species of Hulsea, Hulsea heterochroma. Uh, it's one that I hope um, I might be seeing very soon as it's a fire follower and we just had some extraordinary large fires in California this past year. I don't know if it'll come up this year, but it certainly has the ability to come up um, a few years after a burn. Uh, so if we have good rain next year, that might be a good time to see the species around um, Hulsea heterochroma. I've seen it many, many times in the field, but realized I didn't have my own photograph of it. I was really upset. I was like, oh my gosh, I need to get a photo of Hulsea heterochroma. Um, but it's, it's beautiful. It's fairly large, um, herbaceous annual to very short-lived perennial. Uh, probably gets about um, a, a meter or a little more high. And then I this uh, talk on Southern California plants um, or it, plants in the sunflower family wouldn't be complete without at least one annual. And I love annual plants. They are um, a group that I'm particularly drawn to. Uh, Centricopapus lemini is um, a, a relatively rare annual that occurs at the edge of desert to montane regions uh, across Southern California. 
Uh, here's a map of its distribution. And you can see here are the, the mountainous areas and the populations kind of hug the mountains but occur really in more desert habitats at the edge of the Mojave Desert. Uh, the Mojave Desert is exceptional for annual plant diversity where over 50% of the species are annuals. And so this makes up one of the um, sub part of the, the great exceptional annual flora of the Mojave Desert. So they don't come up necessarily every year, uh, but when they do come up, it's great. Uh, this plant is rare and does have threats, um, urban sprawl, off-highway vehicles, and wind energy development, especially in this area, um, are predominant. Um, but um, there's many, many populations and, and this plant isn't so threatened that it requires federal listing or listing under the Endangered Species Act, but um, it's a really cool plant. And my favorite thing about this plant is a little surprise behind the ray flowers and it has these pink stripes here uh, that you can see better in this photograph. And that's one of my favorite things about this plant. And um, this talk, um, I've, I've been definitely needed to include this plant, Dinandra mojavensis, the Mojave tarweed. Um, this is a plant that was previously thought to be extinct, uh, but it was rediscovered in 1994. Um, it's a conservation success story for sure, because since its rediscovery, many more populations have been mapped. And um, this uh, is a special plant for me, uh, because I feel like it, it's a plant that's important, that has been, Basically, I might not be a botanist if I didn't kind of interface with this plant. Uh, it was my first botanical research project and one of my first field surveys as an undergraduate was to look for this plant. And so um, my previous boss, Steve Boyd, who is the curator of the herbarium um, at Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden, he invited me on a field trip to go look for this species at its type locality, where, which is on the north side of the San Bernardino Mountains. It hadn't been seen there since it was collected there in the late 1800s by Edward Palmer. And um, so no one had ever relocated it there. And we went to go look and we didn't find it there, but he said, well, we can go to another place where I know it occurs. Let's go check it out. And so we went there and it was to this place, a short canyon, which is in the Eastern Sierra Nevada, um, where it interfaces with the Mojave Desert. And we found it in these kind of areas where there's some spring um, springs coming up. This is a plant that's a late bloomer. It blooms in August, September, October. It's an annual plant. And I think it had been thought to be extinct because people weren't looking for it really. It was, um, it blooms at a time where people aren't out, you know, collecting plants like mad. Um, so it just kind of went under the radar. But it turns out it's actually, it's not extraordinarily common, but it's certainly not in danger of becoming extinct. Um, and it occurs in some really great intact habitat like here in Short Canyon. Uh, this site actually then turned out to be the place where I did my master's thesis and I did a floristic study here. Uh, so it was, this plant brought me to this place. And so <laughs> I'm grateful for that. And with that, I want to thank you. This is a photograph from Joshua Tree National Park. And I'm here with my colleagues, Tasha Ledoux and Tim Tebow. And on this trip, we were on the hunt for an, a threatened plant, Origeron parishii, uh, to collect its seeds. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Naomi. Thank you, lots of uh, digital applause. And that was a really great story about how you got started on your flora. If anybody wants to ask a question, you know, uh, by unmuting themselves, they're welcome. Um, otherwise, you can put questions in the chat. These talks are really great so far. Uh, next, we're going to have uh, Carol, but you know maybe you can you, you don't need an introduction from me. You can introduce yourself, and everybody here probably already knows you. So, uh, why don't you take yes. it? Yes. Uh, no, Naomi. Uh, great talk. Uh, the person that was doodling apologized. She uh, they they thought that uh, the annotations were not being seen by everybody, so it was just a misunderstanding. Um, um, well, I'm I'm Carol. Uh, I'm a postdoc at Mississippi State University, um, and I'm from Brazil. I've done most of my field work there, and today I wanted to I wanted to share uh, a little story about field work uh, of a in a very interesting place uh, where a lot of new things are being discovered. Um, so let's go. Uh, oh, 
I just need to find my presentation. No, what am I doing? Sorry, sorry, folks. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, sorry. Uh, I was planning to share like just the presentation and you guys saw my whole life basically. Okay. Um, so the place that I'm going to talk about is called Serra do Padre Ângelo uh, and it's on Eastern Minas Gerais state in Brazil. Uh, and it looks like this big, um, uh, this big mountain. Uh, and it actually is higher elevation than it looks like because it's on top of other mountains. So, um, so the Serra do Padre Angelo is in this little marker here. So in Eastern Minas Gerais, about um, kind of close to the coast, but not so much. And one thing that I wanted to point out that this is the distribution of uh, Cadeia do Espinhaço, which is the main area of uh, Campos Rupestres in Brazil. And I'm going to explain why they're important in the next slide. And this is the Serra do Padre Angelo. So it's basically a massive uh, formed by three mountains, as you can see here. Uh, and so Campos Rupestres, what are they? They are basically a, fixed, a type of vegetation that occurs in elevations about uh, above 900 meters above sea level in Brazil, especially in central Brazil. And they are basically highland rocky fields. So they are fields in high elevation that are uh, composed mainly of a grassy layer. They're usually in a quartz, uh, in high quartz uh, soil and in rock out outcrops, as you can see here. And they usually, they, uh, especially the ones in the central part of the distribution in, in, in the Cadeia do Espinhaço, they are over a very old geological embasement from like more than a billion years ago. So the relief is very, uh, it's very. There's a lot of accidents and mountains and outcrops. It's it's a very beautiful place. The landscape is striking, and they're also home to several uh, very endemic lineages. Some families are basically endemic to this this part of the world. There are lots of other families where large genera are only find found there. So. It's being a place where many people in Brazil are working in the floristic studies and the phylogenomic, phylogenetics studies. Uh, it's been attracted, attracting a lot of attention uh, in the last few years and since the last few de decades, actually. Uh, so the story that I want to tell uh, started uh, in around 2013 when my friend, Dr. Paulo Gonella, here in the photo, he was looking in Facebook groups where people post uh, pictures of plants looking for IDs. And he saw a photo of a trouser, a, a sendu, which was the group that he was studying his, in his PhD. And he's one of the biggest uh, experts in, uh, in droseraceae in Brazil and in the world uh, nowadays. So he was looking through Facebook and he saw a photo of this plant and he's like, this plant is really weird. Uh, it's very big. It's very different from other, plant, of other species that occur in Brazil. And it's from this place where nobody has ever collected. Like he looked around and there were very, very few collections of that, of this Serra, uh, of, uh, of Padre Angelo uh, on, on Herberia in Brazil. So he was very interested in that. So he contacted the person that posted the photo on Facebook and they organized a, 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 a field expedition and he went there, collected the Drosera, which turned out to be new, uh, and he described it, uh, and it became uh, one of the ten uh, more, like one of the ten new species of the year where, when it was published, which was very cool. And besides finding this Drosera, he collected other plants that he thought interesting that that he thought that were interesting in the in the region. And when he came came back to the herbarium, uh, we all were. Uh, doing our PhDs or our postdocs at University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And he showed the plants around and we were like, like all this is new. Like all these plants are like either very rare or they are new. Like nobody, like nobody had ever collected there. And so there was a lot of very interesting things that were that he he brought back. So we set up in set up a second expedition there, uh, mostly with people that work with composite, because some of this new, uh, some of the plants that he brought were composite. And we went there uh, to look for them on the field and see better like where they were growing or they is just is just a uh, geographical variation. Is this actually a species? And it turned out that pretty much everything that he collected there was new in some way. 
So uh, right off the bat, uh, Dr. Benoit Alloy, uh, who, who usually comes to these meetings, he found a new species of Eremantus uh, there. Uh, Eremantus is a genus that is endemic from Brazil. Uh, it occurs mainly in the Cerrado and also in the Campos of Pastures. Uh, it also has secondary heads, as you can see here. Uh, Isaac showed uh, another species that has secondary heads. And he also found, found another, a new species of Lycnophora, uh, which is another genus that is very typical of Campos Rupestris, uh, also endemic from Brazil, uh, also has secondary heads. And uh, we also found two new species uh, of Vernoni from the subtribe Lepidoploini. Uh, this one, uh, Lysingiantus patrios, is a new species, and Lepidoploa campihopestris is an, another new species. And uh, we found this other Lysingiantus here, uh, which was which had been recently described, but from another mountain range very far away from this one. So uh, it, it's a considerable range expansion for a species. And this also happened with two other species of Vernoni that we found in this in this mountain range. Uh, one is in the another one in the in the Lepidoploa genus, as and another one in the genus called Cololobus, uh, which were described for mountains in Espiritu Santo, which is one of the neighboring states uh, from Minas Gerais, and it, it ends up that they also occur in this very isolated mountain range. Uh, so there are two new species of Mycania, which is a cosmopolitan genus that are being described right now by Caetano Oliveira. Uh, one of them has this very beautiful pink bracts, which are very unusual in the genus. Uh, there is a new species of Pepalanthus, which is in family Ericolaceae, which I jokingly uh, call the, the composite of the monocots because they, kind, they, they have like head-like inflorescences. Uh, this species is, is being described by Dr. Caroline, uh, Caroline Andrina here in the photo. And uh, there's a new species of Hippichodendrum, which is in Lamiaceae, uh, that, has, that was the cover of the, the Journal of Adansonia a few months ago, that was described by G Dr. Guilherme Antar, Antar, which is also describing several other uh, species from there. Uh, there was a note uh, about this very impressive Velosias that occur in this mountain. So Velosia gigantea is a species that uh, occurs in very few, few places in the Cadeia do Espinhaço and is an iconic spe uh, species of one uh, specific mountain range within this larger uh, massive of mountains. And it turns out there's an isolated population of this species uh, in this mountain. And these plants, they they live for hundreds of years. They have very slow growth. Uh, so they are um, a flag flagship species for conservation, basically. And they dominate uh, one of the plateaus of this mountain. Uh, and it's a very striking um, um, landscape and vegetation. And as you can see, they are very, very large. They, they can be like up to three meters tall or something. Um, as you can imagine, um, most of the newly described species or uh, this species that had range expansions to this mountain range, they are endangered, endangered or critically endangered, uh, mainly because they are mountaintop endemics. So they have very little uh, area where they can occur. They occur in restricted areas. They present fragmented populations, which is basically like all the, the boxes that you have to tick to classify something as endangered. Uh, they don't have very large populations and all this landscape uh, is threatened by agricultural expansion that is going on massively in Brazil, uh, categorizing uh, the presence of invasive grass species that are planted to provide food for the cattle that are grazing on the, on the places, for in, uh, by intentional fires uh, produced by, by human activity uh, as they clean up uh, large areas by uh, putting, setting them on fire to, to start pastures. Uh, so there are many, many threats uh, for this environment, and there are no conservation units protecting these mountains right now, um, which we hope uh, we'll change soon. Uh, there's a state park somewhat close to that, but these mountains are not included in the state park. And Dr. Paulo Gonella now is, uh, is, has a permanent position in a university close by, and he, he's, he has a permanent project studying the floristics of this, this mountain range, and many more new species of 
in several different families have been found, especially Orchidaceae, Bromeliaceae, and other uh, families that are typical from this type of environments in Brazil. So there is a, a very strong uh, reasoning to start conservation units in this area, and we hope this will come uh, to fruition at some point. And um, that's it for now, and uh, I'll, I can reply to any questions later. So thank you guys. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Okay, well, uh, should I start sharing my screen then? Yes, and I'm going to introduce Mauricio. Uh, so Mauricio is a professor in Montevideo, Uruguay, at Universidad de la República. And he has been up and about the southern part of South America, and we are very excited to see what he's going to show about all the weird composite that occurred there. Okay, uh, I don't know if you guys are seeing my screen now. Can you see the title of the presentation? Okay. Uh, well, um, my idea for this, you know, talk today was to share with you some images uh, taken of some um, weird composite from a land that I'm fascinated with, which is uh, Patagonia. Mm. So it's a very windy place, um, as you could kind of hint uh, from the second title. And this image that you're seeing here is one of the most iconic mountains in the whole Patagonia area. And it's a mountain that has actually two names. Uh, it has a native name, which means a mountain of fire, that is Chalten uh, in the you know, indigenous uh, language. And they, it was also being renamed uh, following the name of uh, the captain of the Beagle. So Fitzroy, it's also the name by which this mountain is also known. Okay, so just to give a you know, very general idea of where this area is located, but this is where, uh, you know, a patch of land that is uh, towards the end of South America. Uh, of the map uh, where uh, maps of old used to have very warning signs about monsters and weird things happening there. Uh, so <laughs> Patagonia is a, you know, it's a semi-desert area that basically for the most part occurs uh, largely in Argentina, but it extends a little bit into Southern Chile as well. Uh, the Northern border of Patagonia is the, north of, the northern border of the Argentinian provinces of Neuquén and Rio Negro. That is the geographic Patagonia, but uh, biogeographic Patagonia extends so, you know, just a little bit farther, farther north, north in a sort of ecotone with another biogeographic uh, province known as the Monte. So um, for the most part, uh, Patagonia is characterized by uh, steppe vegetation. So, so it's a very, very, um, uh, you know, uh, semi-desertic, sort of speak, uh, vegetation where compositity and uh, grasses are uh, usually the dominant um, ecological uh, elements in the vegetation. So the plants I picked for this presentation are plants that are, are either very common, uh, so they constitute an important element of the vegetation there, or they are kind of weird in the sense that you are, uh, only going to see them there, both criteria. Uh, OK, so this is an image taken uh, in, the, in the very southern tip. Uh, this is uh, Lake uh, Viedma, one of the largest lake in, in, the, in, the, in, in southern Santa Cruz in Argentina. And there you can see a typical Patagonian landscape, you like mountains in the background. And then uh, on the foreground, you see the yellowish patches of grasses for, for the most part, uh, species belonging to Festuca or uh, you know, Stipa or some of the segregates in which Stipa has been segregated now, like Nacella or Haraba. And the, the rest of the stuff, the grayish stuff, where well, those are comps. And in this particular case, that's a Sinicio. Uh, Sinicio phylogenoides, it's, 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 um, it, it, it's, it's a very common species throughout uh, Patagonia. So that, that's what I call a typical uh, Patagonian landscape in the sense that you have uh, as the main uh, components of the vegetation, comps and grasses. Uh, 
But then you also have these uh, other elements in the vegetation that could create some dramatic landscape that you see here. And uh, in this particular case, you have the family APAC, you know, taking a big uh, chunk of uh, the whole biomass that you see in this, uh, in, in this vegetation. In this particular case, we are uh, seeing the genus Mulinum, and this, uh, this very common species throughout Patagonia, which is uh, Mulinum spinosus. But you also get other species of Mulinum, and when you are you know, reaching farther north and you enter into Puna uh, and into the, the high Andes, you also start seeing uh, plants that look like these and also belong to the APAC and belong to other genera like Azorella, for instance. So uh, even when composite and grasses are the dominant element, uh, in certain areas you could have other species from other families that will take uh, an important part of the, of the whole biomass. So here is another example of the sort of landscape you're gonna see. So, it's interesting to see that when you move from those the last two photos were taken next to the Andes, this is more next to the uh, Atlantic Ocean. So as you move from the Andes to the Atlantic Ocean, so east, uh, Patagonia starts to get drier and drier. So the vegetation tends to be more um, dispersed and uh, not as lush as we saw in the last uh, few photos. And in this particular case, all that uh, you know, blackish shrubs that you see there is yet another family that could be uh, relevant and important, and in certain cases, a dominant one in the Patagonian landscape, which is the Verbenaceae. In this particular case, with the genus Junelia. So this, so you get an idea of what sort of um, habitat might look like when you are um, traveling through Patagonia. But it's very diverse. This is just a very meager, uh, you know. Um, you know, sample of what you uh, are going to expect there. You know, people that is not, that is not very familiar with, with plants, they will travel through Patagonia and say, oh, it was all a semi-desert, but, you know, each, you know, 10 or maybe 20 kilometers, you know, a new species will take over and you see, you know, very interesting variation uh, throughout this, you know, very extensive uh, patch of plant. So uh, this is a talk about the composite, but I felt that you know I had to show these um, uh, an image of the sister family of the composite. This is this is the Caliceraceae. This uh, a thing that looks almost like a you know broccoli uh, belongs in the genus Gamocarpha, and can to hint you into the idea of how this plant this fam this plant family is related to the composite. You know, being a sister family. Galliceraceae is a family that is, you know, restricted to South America with the most diversity uh, in, in the southern end uh, of the continent. And uh, as you can see here, they also share the presence of uh, flowers, um, you know, in very condensed inflorescence in the shape of heads. Uh, but there, are, there are some substantial differences in terms of how the ovules are attached and also in uh, the way uh, the, of the venation of, of the corollas. There's also difference in the way the stamens are arranged. The stamens in the calyceraceae have the anthers free, uh, you know, contrasting with what happened in the, in the compositing. Uh, and there's other, other differences as well. Um, here's a close-up of one of those heads, and you can see the stamens there uh, with the anthers free. Uh, but you can see uh, also, that the um, we have here in the Caliceraceae sort of secondary um, uh, pollen presentation mechanism as well as it happened in the in the in the composite. But another interesting feature of um, the Caliceraceae is uh, the way the inflorescence is structured. So if you see this image here, I couldn't ID this Caliceraceae yet. But you, if you focus on the uh, on the head on the right, uh, let's see. I don't know if my uh, pointer my pointer is not I'm marking now here. I think uh, you will see that it looks like the head, the flowers in the head are like opening very in a very disorderly array. Um, that there's nothing disorderly about this. It's just that the this uh, inflorescence is what is called a cephaloid in contrast with what happened in the composite, which you have a, a, a capitulum uh, 
truly, right? So a cephaloid is a sort of teresoid um, in which you will have an apical floret that uh, open first. So it is not uh, weird to see in the calyceraceae that you will find flowers in the center of the head that are opening. And that is another bigger difference uh, between this family and uh, the sister family, the, uh, the compositi. So uh, throughout Patagonia, you will see, uh, you know, quite a few species of uh, calyceraceae. So uh, be ready for them. All right, um, so this is uh, the coast of the Atlantic Ocean um, uh, in the province of Chubut in this particular case. And the yellow stuff that you see uh, there occupying most of the vegetation, that is that belongs to a subfamily, actually the, the, the basal moss um, lineage in the in composite family, which is the Barnadisioidi. So if we, that's Chupuraga avellanidae, one of the commonest species of Chupuraga. Chupuraga is one of the largest uh, genera in the Barnadisioidi. So there you have a close um, look at the, um, at, the, uh, at the plant, it's a shrub. So uh, all Chupuragas are shrubs. Some of them are grow very well at press the ground. So others form like a more um, robust uh, shrubs. And uh, I wanna show some details now of, uh, of the heads and the vegetative part, so you could get an idea of what a, you know, Barnadisioide looks like. So uh, one of the defining um, traits that you will see in most, uh, in most uh, Barnadisioide is uh, the presence of what is called the Barnadisioide trichomes. And uh, it's not a character that you will see in the field necessarily, but uh, it's an important trait. And basically, Barnadisioid trichome is a trichome that, uh, that has three cells, uh, as you can see in the diagram on the left. One cell that is uh, you know, at the same level of the epidermis, the rest of the epidermis, that is. Then you have another small cell that is called the articulating cell. And then you have a one uh, long cell. Uh, so those three cells are the, cell, the cells that make up the, a typical Barnadisioid trichome. And you're going to see that sort of trichome throughout different parts of the body, in the vegetative parts and also in the reproductive part. And that is one of the most uh, important defining features of the, of the tribe. Also, not necessarily universal, but very common in, in, in most um, uh, genera of the Barnadisioide, you have the stiff fillaries, very, always with a very sharp uh, tip and usually very stiff, you know, very hard. And then another feature, it's, you can see in the vegetative, vegetative body, um, which is the axillary spines. So that is also something very typical of the Barnadisioide. Of course, you have traits about the Corolla and the styles, you know, uh, the styles being slender and with very, very short uh, branches. And, um, but you know, from uh, talking about characteristics that you can see in the field, these are one of the most uh, distinctive ones. Then uh, you have another tribe that is, you know, uh, very, very uh, important here in Patagonia, which is the tribe Nassaubi. And in this case, you have one of the, when the, the type of genus, genus Nassaubi, and in this case with the species Nassaubia machichanica. And what happens here, let, let me show you a close up of one of the heads. There you can see one of the heads and you can see the, by the typical bilabiate corollas and you can see the truncate style uh, branches. Uh, that's typical of the Nassauini with, uh, of the Nassaubi, I'm sorry, the Nassaubi tribe with the uh, truncate apical uh, branches and with a tooth of collector trichomes in the very apex. And the other thing that you could actually see, see somehow here is that all that we are looking right now is not a head. But it's uh, an aggregation of head. Uh, it, it, because of the organization, it doesn't actually is a pseudocephalium, but it's like he is, you know, willing very strongly to be a pseudocephalium. Yeah, you know, if we measure it by, you know, how um, clustered those heads uh, actually are. Uh, in, there are, you know, quite a, quite a bunch of species of Nasawia of different shapes and sizes. 
Uh, but one of the most defining features of the genus, besides those that I already mentioned, is that the heads are very small uh, in terms of number of flowers. It could even have four or five uh, florets each. So here's another species of Nasauvia, and you could actually count uh, easier uh, the, fl the florets per head uh, in, in these uh, particular uh, species. Here is another species of Nasauvia. This is very common. This uh, it could grow up to you know maybe half a meter tall, and uh, it's very spiny. So it has very spiny leaves. Very very you know evidently a plant you know a very acidic habitat like this one you're seeing here. And if we look, uh, if we take a, a closer look at the at the heads on the right, you will see that there's very few number of florets per head. You could also see the style shape uh, in, in, in some of the flowers at least. And on the left side, you can see the vegetative body of the plant. So those large spines that you see there are actually the tips of the standard leaves. And on the axle of those leaves, you have short shoots or what is also known as brachyblasts, that is stems with very short internodes and uh, leaves that are the ones that remain green for the most part. So. The, the, the ones that you see here, like dry, like, like, like thorns, um, those, uh, you know, actually sinis, uh, at least, you know, early in the life of the branch and are substituted, you know, in terms of photosynthesis power by these uh, lateral branches that you see, uh, you know, covering the whole stem. So it's, it's a very peculiar shape of the plant. It's not, it's not like you have seen just one stem there, there are, you know, literally tens of stems that we are, you know, seeing uh, right there. Um, so moving on, here is another example of an Asaubini. This is a genus that is endemic of Patagonia. There are several genera that are endemic of Patagonia and most of them are uh, in the composite. So this is one of those. Let me show you some uh, close up of this. So this is the genus Ameguinoa. This is uh, Ameguinoa Patagonica. And you can clearly see there the uh, bilabiate, uh, the typical bilabiate corollas, you know, with the uh, outer lip, you know, with three uh, petals and the, you know, inner lip with two uh, petals showing very clearly there. This is another genus important uh, throughout Patagonia. And, you know, uh, it's also prevalent throughout the Andes. This is the genus Peresia. This is one of the common species uh, in, in Patagonia, Peresia lanigera. You, you could also see the, uh, the typical Nassauvi style with the truncate uh, apex there. Another, another Parisia, this is Parisia magiganica. That's a beautiful uh, composite that you were likely see to the, towards the southern tip of Patagonia. You, when, you, when you look at it uh, from a distance, it reminds of um, that uh, composite in the, in the Nafali, the Edelweiss. The Edelweiss. Um, so here you have another uh, endemic genus um, from Patagonia. This is genus Burcardia, which was described by Jorge Crisi, my um, PhD advisor. Uh, this is closely related to the genus Peresia, and this forms uh, cushion-shaped um, shrubs, very, very, um, you know, compact and pressed uh, to the ground. Here's another, another genus, you know, this is really beautiful plants, also in the Nassauvi. Uh, this is the genus Leucaria, you know, very, very showy plants that, uh, you know, with, that can occupy also, you know, uh, the, um, these dry areas, but also they could have it, you know, in the understory of the Notophagus forest, such as this. So some of the uh, leucherias that you see uh, grow above the tree line. Some others grow, uh, you know, in the, in, in the plateaus, in the semi-desert area, but other could occur in, inside the, um, the Notophagus forest that we are seeing here. So, and associated with the Notophagus forest, you know, there's quite a few species of Muticias, of which this is one of the uh, most common ones, Muticia decurrence. Now with very showy head, you know, this measures almost, you know, six to seven centimeters in diameter of the head. So it's really something uh, hard to miss. And if you look closely here at the head, you will see the tips of the, uh, the styles, you know, very typical Mutisi, 
with very short branches and no trichomes whatsoever associated with the with the with the tips of the of the answer the tips of the of, of style branches. Um, okay, and now I want to show you some really weird um, compositing that is located in these sort of habitats. Um, so in the understory of the forest, but sometimes on the, on the very edge. And it's planned that for a time it was, uh, you know, not clear what it belonged. It was for a long time in the tree, tribe Inuli. Uh, once, uh, one time it was also put in the Cardui, and I believe there were it was also present in some uh, other other tribe as well. And uh, and the recently, more or less recently, it was demonstrated that it, be, it belonged in the Mutisi. So check this out. This is the genus Adenocaulum. And uh, it's a genus with a very weird distribution because it's occurred in this area uh, of Patagonia, but it also occurs in North America and in Asia. And so if you look at those heads, you know, it, it's hard uh, to figure out why it, it had missed it, its home, the Mutisi. You know, it doesn't have the showy, uh, you know, corollas of the Mutisi. So you see there the marginal florets and you could also have these florets. And you can see that the marginal florets are bilabiate, uh, but you know when you look at this plant and you compare it to the muticia that I just show you, they are sort of different. But you know they, when you start looking at the tiny details, well, you kind of see some resemblance um, in, in 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 that regard. So one of the things that prevented this from being in Mutisi for a long time was the fact that it was not showy or very colorful. And also that the tails of the anther were not very long as is typical of the Mutisi. And uh, so th let me show you uh, the fruits because the fruits are really cool. So uh, this is a fruiting head. Uh, only the, the peripheral florets uh, will produce, uh, mm, you know, viable fruits. And they are covered by those, um, you know, Glandular trichomes, very notorious there. You know, the flowers on the inside, they don't shed, you know, um, viable uh, akins. So it's, it's a very, very peculiar composite and no pappus as, as you can see there. Well, this is a, a weird uh, composite that turned out to be the sister of this other weird uh, composite at the knockout that I just showed you. So this is an endemic of Patagonia, Ericiaenium magellanicum. This is a plant that grows at pressed to the ground in the in what is the the, um, the border of you know muddy uh, la lagoons uh, throughout Patagonia, and as you can see, the leaves somehow resemble the leaves of the Adenocaulum in the sense of the um, venation. They are very discolorous, kind of fleshy, uh, and when you look at the at the heads. They also have some similarities in the sense that even when the heads have two sets of um, two type of florets, they are not very um, they are not very different from each other, at least from the naked eye. So here you can see, uh, I think I put uh, arrow there. Yeah, you can see there the marginal for you can tell them they don't have any stamens, and you can see you can tell the inner floret because those are the ones that have the, the stamens. But you can also see there the very short uh, style branches. And in this particular case, the corollas on the, of the marginal florets vary. They could have either five uh, lobes, as in this case, but it could also have four lobes. So that's a, that's a, that, that's a weird comp that you are uh, going to see there in Patagonia. And look at this. this um, we discover uh, it was not reported in the literature. Uh, I believe uh, the shape uh, that the, the underground stem for this plant had. So these are flattened stems. So that's why I put two, two images. You could get the idea. You could see the, uh, the lift scars and the, the way they are, they, they are flattened. You know, they're very, very peculiar um, morphology for these, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, rhizomes um, on, on the, on the Oria Canyon. Okay, uh, this is another common thing that you are likely seeing in Patagonia and also extending a little bit into the, into the Monte um, Biogeographic province. This is the type genus of uh, one of the um, uh, basal uh, lineages in the composite. This belongs in the tribe Yalidi. 
And this is a very peculiar tribe in the sense that it has elements uh, in America and also in Asia. And it's very, it used to be uh, considered very related to the Cognati. Now it's considered to be, uh, um, you know, very close to uh, a Stifti uh, um, tribe. And uh, some of the traits that you, you're going to see there, this, this is a, um, an heterogamous head with, uh, you know, other florets with very, um, with uh, also bilabial corollas, but a very long limb. And then you have inner, uh, the, the inner florets with, um, with, very, with very long uh, lobes uh, that are all coiled up there. And you can see there, uh, the, the, there are no styles still coming out, but you can see the apex of the enters. And that's also one of the defining uh, features of the Yalivi. They have these apiculate uh, anther appendages. This is a very common in Patagonia, especially in the northern part of Patagonia. Uh, but you are likely to see it if you see uh, you visit uh, the Monte Biogeographic region. The, you know, just as a parenthesis, the Monte Biogeographic province is a very important semi-desert area, also dominated by Zygophilaceae in South America. Uh, so this is uh, far from the you know basal linges that I show you, but it's also something very common uh, throughout Patagonia, especially along the Andes, and when you reach south, extending beyond the Andes and occupying also the, the flatlands. This is the genus in which I did my uh, doctoral dissertation. This is Chiliotrichum diffusum. Um, so it's very it's a very archetypical daisy if if you like. And uh, so it's very common. You are mostly, you know, certain that you're going to see it if you visit Patagonia. And the, the historical, you know, interesting thing about this is that was planned described uh, during the second of the Cook voyages around the world uh, by the Foster's brothers. Although the genus is a genus that was coined by, by Cassini. And uh, these plants belong into a group in the tribe Asteri that is called the Paleo uh, South American group, a, a group of uh, genera that are uh, that part of the, the, the basal most lineages in the whole tribe Asteri. And one of the defining features of the, this group of genera to which Kilitrichum belongs to is the presence of Paleo in the in the in the receptacle. So all those you know um, very hairy structures you see there, those are the tips of the pallia, also known as receptacular bracts. So that's the, the killer tray for the chiliotrichum group to which uh, chiliotrichum diffusion gives its name. This is another uh, interesting plant, very common, but mostly in coastal areas uh, or in you know, areas that have a saline uh, influence. This is the genus Lepidophilum, another endemism of Patagonia, one of the few endemic genera of Patagonia. You can see on the why the, the epithet cupressiformis, it has opposite leaves and very tiny that resemble the, you know, a plant on, of the genus cupressus. And uh, this also has a very interesting uh, historical connection. Uh, this plant was described by the voyage around the world of Bougainville, the one that, that took the French botanist Commerson, who had as an assistant, Jean Barret, who was uh, hired as a, as a cabin boy but it was actually a woman. So that was the first woman that uh, circumnavigated the world. So I always wonder if these, the type of this plan was collected by Commerson or by Barrett, but uh, I guess that we will never know. Like the today was by Barrett. Will you say her name again? Uh, Jen Barrett. Jen Barrett. I can, I can write it in the, in the, in the, in the chat uh, right after. Um, so this is also belongs into the into the, the Asteri tribe, and as I said, the most remarkable feature about this is the peculiar, um, you know, shape of the leaves and the and the phyllotaxis. And this is, as I said, very very common. You can see fields uh, full of these two where your, you know, eye ends in the horizon uh, along the coast of Santa Cruz uh, for the most part, and also in Tierra del Fuego. This is another image of what you're going to likely see in Patagonia. And what's interesting here is that you see that on the, on the foreground, you have this cushion-shaped shrub, which is the one I want to actually discuss, uh, which is another genus in this Kiliotrichum group. 
Uh, but on the back, you see some blooming stuff, like the, the yellow stuff. Well, that's like leg legumes. So in certain places, you could also have legumes, uh, you know, playing an important part. In this case, it's genus Adesmia. So going back to these Anardophyllum, which is the genus that we are seeing here, Anardophyllum brioides, um, this plant um, uh, used to be considered like two species, one with very open branches, you know, next to the low part of the mountain, and then other with very, very uh, dense and compact branches that usually were associated to the upper part of the mountains or in lower vegetation, but closer to the ocean. And it was uh, proved to be a sort of climb uh, in, the, in the diversity. So another interesting thing. So there you have a head of these, you know, peculiar uh, asteri, uh, typical of Patagonia, the Nardophyllum uh, bryoides. And just to finish, I wanted to share with you a photo that uh, we took uh, during a field trip with Vicky in um, Southern Patagonia. So it was back in 2009 and uh, we came there. Um, so you can see that she had no, no problem at all in, you know, hauling some gear and, you know, doing uh, not uh, so close to the track approaches in terms of collecting. So um, I guess that I, I wanna, you know, dedicate or, you know, express my appreciation to all what she did, um, you know, uh, for me in my career and what she has done for, you know, all of us uh, to, you know, always try to, you know, push um, the frontiers of the, you know, what is known as the compositing. And the fact that we are all together here in this meeting today is uh, thanks to, you know, uh, you know this, this person. So um, with that, I just uh, want to end and I'm gladly take uh, questions. Sorry, that was a little bit more than expected. Thank you, Mauricio, that was great. Uh, great photos and um, an excellent talk. Um, does anybody have any questions? Okay, uh, the talk was recorded and is gonna be uploaded on YouTube uh, later today. And thank you all for, for coming and we are gonna see you again next month on April. Um, keep an eye out on your inboxes and on Twitter and Instagram for announcements about the seminar. Thank you. Mauricio, that was a great talk. <laughs> That was really cool. Yeah, there were a lot of cool comps uh, in 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 all the talks. Um, very very interesting things, you know. In these desert places, you know, you you see weird stuff. Um, that you but try that has the styles bending outward. Uh, <laughs> that's a uh, uh, that's an odd comment. Are there you but in in Patagonia? Uh, I, I don't, I don't remember right now if there's any, certainly though they are not, uh, common if, and if I will have to, I, I will have to look, uh, maybe in the Northern part of Patagonia, there could be some, but, um, I'm, uh, it's not something that strike the eye. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting to see the, um, I thought that those pretty tightly have um, very thick leaves, but that one you show had very sort of fleshy leaves. Uh, you know, it was not the idea I get from, imagine where they grow. No, it's a really, it's, it's a bit of a weird one though. It's a, it's, it grows on dunes and also on some kind of gravel and, uh, it also, there's an, another one that has that same characteristic sister species that's only found on the, the Revilla Guigedo archipelago off the coast of Mexico. And they're, they're, uh, they turn out to be some of the earliest diverging peridolis. So they're, they're not that closely related to the rest of them. They have a different chromosome number. And they're, they're very succulent kind of like, you know, like they're living on an island kind of thing. Uh, trying to think of like a comparison, maybe some kind of, sedum or something like that they really really are set up for living with very little water a little bit of fog maybe 
Well, one other, other thing that I wanted to commend is that something I, I love about Patagonia is that you don't have, um, you know, any poisonous animal that could, you know, be lurking there. Although, <laughs> although that's not entirely true for the whole range. There's in the northernmost uh, part of Patagonia towards the Atlantic Ocean, where you have Peninsula Valdez, which is a, you know, hammer-shaped peninsula. Uh, over there, there's a morpho of a viper that lurks. Imagine where inside the shrubs. So you imagine you are looking at your favorite calm there, and you have a viper there. So I, I, uh, I realized that after I have done a few trips. Luckily, I never encountered one. But you know, except for that part, the rest of Patagonia is free from any poisonous animal. So you know, it's very, very, very cool in that in that regard. That's lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sukraj, if you, you if you'd like to unmute yourself, you could ask your question too. Now we just have a smaller group, but uh, I saw you you put a question in the chat. She, she was wondering. Uh, we saw some. Oh, you want to go ahead? Or no? You, uh, uh -huh. We saw some glandular hairs and fruits. I was wondering if someone would know anything about the role of glands on the leaves. Just curious. There's a question from uh, Sukraj. My day will be just, you know, uh, chemical defense, maybe. Um, you know, columns are known for having that in their arsenal. So I will suspect that some of them could even go, you know, extreme, you know, <laughs> having that condensed in the outer part. So they're just the mere touch and there's no much chewing to do. Um, uh, but in this particular case, that the one I show, uh, it was just dispersal. Uh, in, in, in that regard. In, but thanks for the question, Sra. In, in Naomi's talk, she showed one of the tar weeds. Uh, that's a, a tribe of, of composites here in California. It's really diverse. And they are almost all covered in these super dense glands that are, uh, they smell like tar because they actually produce really complex hydrocarbon kind of organic molecules. And uh, they're also very rich in polysaccharides. So they, they kind of have like a dual function. They make the plant really inedible to herbivores. And they also make it uh, impenetrable to uh, like the elements to, to desiccation from the wind and stuff like that. So they help the plant grow in really dry places, but they also help protect it against herbivores. But there's actually some, some specialized uh, butterflies and moths that have learned to circumvent the the glands and they and they eat these plants and actually that plant that that naomi showed has like an endemic you know like a, a moth that only lives on that one plant so uh when they rediscovered the plant they actually rediscovered the moth as well it's kind of cool so what do they eat they just the mesophyll somehow uh no they eat they eat actually they they just like gobble up thing. plants and uh and they actually, uh, they eat some of the leaves, but they prefer the fruits, which makes them pretty deadly to the plant, you know, cause they go and they kill the whole progeny. They, they tunnel into, they get the, first of all, they walk across the glands like they're nothing. And then they tunnel right into the head and just live in there and eat all the fruits. It's bad. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, Mauricio, I would like to get some of your photos to show uh, to a systematics class, especially the the um, the Calisaraceae photos. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll share. I sh I'll share uh, a link to those to you. Yeah. Does anybody else have uh, questions for Mauricio or or comments or want to share anything? Say hi. Uh, I think somebody asked for the name of that. Uh... I put it in the uh, in the oh, chat. Okay. If you look around, four fifty Jan Barrett. Um, let me double check the spelling. Uh, it's with a double double N. Uh, I'm gonna put it again there, oh, just to, just to be sure. So it's, it's, it's a really fascinating story. There, there are several books uh, um, written 
Okay, here it is. So uh, there are several books written about that story. Uh, to, apparently, uh, Commerson even had a son uh, with her uh, in, in France before leaving for the trip. Commerson never make it uh, after the end of the trip. I don't remember exactly where he passed away, uh, but he died during the trip. But Barrett, you know, actually made it. Uh, but they discover her disguise in the Polynesia. So uh, somehow she tricked everybody. You know, there were, as you could imagine, there were strict rules in terms of, you know, the reasons that, you, you, that, you know, preventing a woman from going into a ship, uh, you know, together with, you know, a lot of people there. And so they were, you know, violating the law. Um, so, you know, she, she had to, you know, put up with a lot of stuff there. Uh, you know, life on those boats was not an easy or as romantic as one would like to imagine. Uh, so she, she endured all that and, uh, you know, uh, helped Commerson along the way uh, to, to, to collect all that stuff. She was a healer. That's apparently was the connection that, hap that, that uh, existed in France. So she, she knew about plants that they, they're used to. So then that's how they got, you know, originally acquired uh, in, in, in France. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 a, it's an inter interesting story. Thank you for joining Alex. Alexander, uh, what time is it where, where you are? Yeah, well, that is the problem. I didn't see the small print in the last invitation emails, but I missed the first few talks, unfortunately. I'm looking forward to seeing the recordings. I thought you would start at 6.30, but actually you're starting at 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it, that's one of our tricky obstacles we have to figure out is timing. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's a tough one, though, because, uh, you know, with all different time zones, um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's complicated to have one that will uh, fit everyone. You, you know, this one will be more or less okay for the Americas and Europe and, and Africa, but then you have Oceania and Asia that, you know, are uh, in the early hours or in the wee hours. Um, Oh, yeah, well, know. it's not There's a way around. Is, yeah, this is not every day, so uh, I guess it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was a great... Yeah, that's a positive attitude. <laughs> this, was a great, this was a great idea uh, to have a bunch of talks from the field. So maybe, maybe we'll do it again and we can have a different geographic areas represented. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I would like to, you know, invite all the ones that are still present that haven't joined the TCAP, that, uh, you know, now we have a form that you could fill and uh, that way we'll, you know, have your information to um, direct uh, whatever information we have. Uh, but uh, the idea is to post everything, you know, all news in the site, uh, but sometimes the site doesn't get updated as often as we would like. And in that case, we resort to uh, sending emails. Um, in that way, having uh, uh, all your information uh, it, it will help that. And also, you know, soon we will also add that information on the website. So people will be, be able to, to know uh, where you are, what, what your interest in the composite. So the potential for collaboration uh, could you know, expand considerably. So um, I think it will be good uh, for all of us if we start, you know, you know populating that. So I appreciate if you could take a time to do that. All right. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to sign off here. Thank you everybody for coming. All right. Thank you, Mauricio. For great okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Great talk. Bye.